Next week, Lord willing, Pastor Don is going to deliver the seventh, the final message in our One Another series. We weren't sure if he'd be back in time. He wouldn't have time to prepare to preach this Sunday, so I'm here this morning, and as it's Father's Day, I thought it would be appropriate, it would be good for us to consider fatherhood, and more especially, precisely, the fatherhood of our God. If you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to open them with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And before we look to the Word of God this morning, let's go ahead and look to the God of the Word in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we ask that your name would be hallowed in the preaching and in the hearing of your Word this morning. Teach us of your wondrous love for us and how we can love you more and more each day, I pray. Amen. What are you so afraid of? From birth to death, the human experience, it's littered with a plethora of fears, even phobias. People are paralyzed with fear in this world. In this world, from childhood to adulthood, it seems like fear is lurking behind every corner and we can't escape. I remember as a a child, I was terribly afraid of sleeping in the dark. One summer, my family took a vacation down to my aunt and uncle's farm in Iowa, And that first night, I vividly recall waking up in the middle of the night to a very pitch black bedroom, and I was in a panic because I believed that I had literally gone blind. I was so fearful of the dark. And so for months, or maybe even up to a year after that, I don't recall, I did sleep with every light on in my bedroom. Every corner had to be lit up. Every shadow had to be vanquished with light if I could manage it. And now that I'm an adult, I find that I can't sleep without it being pitch black in my bedroom. We need room darkening curtains. Even my alarm clock has to be set to the the dimmest light. But while I might have grown out of the fear of sleeping in the dark, I can promise you that that doesn't mean that I haven't replaced it with some other fear or fears in my life. What are you so afraid of? That's essentially the question that Jesus is addressing as he's teaching his disciples in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 12. Basically, Jesus spotlights three really big fears that he knew his disciples would have in this world. And these are certainly fears that we tend to gravitate toward today as well. If you look at chapter 12 and verse 4, Jesus, he addresses the fear of losing your life. Do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more they can do. In other words, what's the worst man can do to you? He can only kill you, is what Jesus is saying. That's it. And then in verses 22 to 31, Jesus addresses the fear of lacking what you need. That might be a fear for you. Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life, what you're going to eat, or about your body, what you're going to put on. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you're to drink, nor be worried, Jesus says. Some of you are in this position today, or or you have been in this position sometime in the past. You're anxious, or you have been anxious, about the bare necessities, the very basics of life and survival. And then, in verses 32 to 34, Jesus seems to address a third fear that we tend to gravitate toward, the fear of losing what you have. Fear not, little flock, Jesus says. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we cling to our possessions, we clutch our purses, our pocketbooks, perhaps because we are treasuring our stuff and our money in this world. And so if we're afraid, maybe we're afraid of tomorrow, what it might bring of losing what we currently have, what we treasure today. And maybe that fear restrains us from being generous and charitable to others who have a need. Throughout his discourse, Jesus strategically offers the remedy to each of these three big fears to those who fear God and who have put their faith in him. Really, when you look at the remedy to each of these fears... It all comes down, it all boils down to the fatherhood of God. If you have God as your father, you have nothing in all the world to fear. 
And so I want us to zoom in on just verse 32 and consider this glorious, fear-eradicating fact that we have God as our Father if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to consider this this morning. The fatherhood of God means freedom from every fear because he loves those whose faith is in him. Christian, whatever you're afraid of, whatever you're anxious about today, the fatherhood of God is the antidote. Jesus says to each of his disciples, even to his disciples today in this room, fear not. You are little, but you are loved by your father. In verse 32, Jesus offers us three gloriously great reasons to fear not. Let me show you each of these three reasons. Number one, Firstly, fear not because we are God's flock. Verse 32, it's chock full of imagery. The the first image we run into in the verse is of a shepherd and his flock. That's how Jesus addresses his disciples. And that's familiar biblical imagery to those of us who, who know our Bibles. Both Old and New Testament speak of God or of Jesus as our shepherd. Let me give you two examples, two samples from the Old Testament and then two samples of the New Testament where we see this. The most familiar, of course, is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To have the Lord as your shepherd, to be among his flock, according to David, means you experience God's superabundant provision so that you never lack the necessities like food, drink, or rest. To be in his flock, to be numbered among them, means that you have his presence wherever you may be, wherever you may go, even in the deepest, darkest of valleys, even through the valley of the shadow of death. To be among God's sheep means protection from wolves and thieves. Your enemies means that you'll experience God's goodness, the shepherd's mercy, not just some of the days out of your life, but all of the days of your life, even forever in the house of the Lord. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah likens the Lord to a shepherd and his people to the Lord's flock. He says that God will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. In case we have any doubts or fears as to how this divine shepherd really cares for his little flock, Isaiah reassures us that our shepherd is tender and he's gentle. He picks us up. He carries us very close to his heart because we are very dear to him. Or consider two samples from the New Testament. You probably are familiar with these passages. John chapter 10, Jesus is teaching here. He says, I came that my flock may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Or if you go to the book of Acts, before Paul departs from Miletus, he's speaking to the Ephesian elders, and he's giving them some final instructions about how they're going to be overseeing their church in Ephesus, and this is what he says to them. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So observe how well provided for God's flock are, how well protected they are, how safe and how secure they are from anything they might ever fear. As God's flock, we have a shepherd who not only makes sure that we never have any lack, who not only takes us into green pastures, leads us beside still waters, who restores our souls, walks with us in darkness, even through the valley of the shadow of death, who exalts us over our enemies by preparing a table before them, and who gently holds us in his arms close to his heart. But we have a shepherd, we have a shepherd who gave his life for his flock, who purchased us at the highest price. God's flock has the best shepherd because he bought them with his own blood. As God's flock, we have nothing to fear. What can wolves, what can thieves do to those who have eternal life? What do we lack that our shepherd can't provide? What do we have that if we lost could somehow take away from the abundant life he promises to give to his sheep? 
We have a shepherd that has gone through death and through the grave on our behalf, and he's come out the other side victorious, and he promises that he ever lives to intercede for us. What do we need that he can't give? What do we fear that he can't calm? Jesus says, you have nothing to fear, little flock, for you are loved by your shepherd. You're loved by me, Jesus is saying. Secondly, on top of being a part of God's flock, another reason we have not to fear is because we are God's family. Jesus, he piles on yet another metaphor. Fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus, he's extremely careful in his word choice here, I think. Typically in the Gospels, we see Jesus talk about God the Father as his father. He'll typically say something to the effect, my father, or perhaps generally he'll just say the father. But here, Jesus calls God your father. And your father, Jesus keeps on explaining, has a kingdom, which means that God is a king. But Jesus doesn't say, fear not, little flock, for it's your king's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. No, Jesus actually says it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why is that significant? What's the difference between those two ways of putting it? I think it's intentional here because if the king of the kingdom is your father, then you are his heirs and you're not mere peasants, paupers, or just mere subjects of the king's kingdom. Since the king of the kingdom is your father, it means that you stand to inherit what is your father's. And if your father is the king, you stand to inherit all of his kingdom. This inheritance, it's not for peasants, it's not for paupers, it's not for mere subjects, it's only for princes and princesses. It is for God's sons and God's daughters, in other words. Elsewhere, when preaching on his second coming, Jesus said that he will say this to his sheep on that great day. He says, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Note that word, inherit. An inheritance is for the family, and the inheritance of a kingdom is for the royal family. It's for the king's children. It's as if Jesus is saying to his disciples, when you come of age, all that belongs to your father, the king, is going to be yours. Do you see how the fatherhood of God serves to quiet your fears your anxieties, and your worries. Maybe you don't. Maybe you didn't, or maybe you don't currently have the best of fathers here on earth. Perhaps Father's Day to you is just another hallmark holiday. Your father was absent in your life, or worse, he was physically or verbally or somehow emotionally abusive to you. Your father didn't and doesn't currently give you gifts. You're not in his will even. Maybe he's promised never to give you a single cent of his inheritance. When you see God described as father in the Bible, it doesn't give you all warm, fuzzy feelings inside, perhaps. Maybe it makes your chest tighten, your heart constrict. But you need to understand something about God. In Scripture, he's described as the perfect father you never had. And for those of us who have had or currently have amazing earthly fathers, we all need to understand that not even our earthly fathers measure up to our heavenly father. We heard in the scripture reading earlier that our father, the Lord, shows compassion to his children. He knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. Put another way, our heavenly father is immeasurably compassionate, infinitely patient with us, and intimately mindful of our faults, our frailties, our failings, our fallings, and our finiteness. That's a good, good father, isn't it? Go back to Luke 12, 32, and I'll show you just how good of a father our God really is to his children. It is your father's good pleasure, Jesus says, to give you the kingdom. Good pleasure. It's one word in the Greek, and it's a verb. It means something to the effect of to be a pleasure, to be pleased by, or to be delighted by, or to be glad in. So you could read Jesus as having said, and maybe your translation says it this way, it pleased, or it delighted, or it made your father glad to give you the kingdom. 
Have you ever opened up a birthday present or a Christmas present that was given to you by your dad? And you could just tell how excited he was to see you unwrap his gift. I can remember on several occasions when my dad had given me a gift, either on my birthday or for Christmas, and I could tell that he just couldn't wait to give it to me. He couldn't wait for me to to unwrap it and to see what his gift was. He's beaming, he's smiling down at me as I'm opening up the gift. And that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father and his gift of the kingdom to his redeemed children. We might believe that he gives his children the kingdom. That's not a problem for us to believe. But maybe we fear that God does it begrudgingly, as if he doesn't really want to do it, or that his heart really isn't fully in it. Jesus is shooting that fear right out of the water, right here. God doesn't grimace like a father handing his teenage daughter the keys to his Rolls Royce when he's giving his children the kingdom. No, it's God's good pleasure. It's your father's delight to give his children their inheritance. He gives the kingdom freely, not because he's forced to, What makes our Heavenly Father happy and giddy with joy inside is to give the kingdom to his sons and daughters bought by the blood of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our Father, he's not hesitant to demonstrate his compassion, his kindness, his goodness, or his love towards those who fear him and have put their faith in him. He doesn't hold you at arm's length or hug you stiffly as if he'd rather be in the next room watching the game on TV. Like a shepherd, he gathers you tenderly into his arms, he draws you close to his own heart, and he freely gives you the greatest gift you could ever imagine. Not because he has to, or because someone told him to, but because he wants to, and because it delights him to do so. Now do you see why the fatherhood of God ought to eradicate and eviscerate every fear we have. His love is lavish, his inheritance is literally out of this world. Fear not, little flock, because we are God's family. We are sons and daughters of the king who stand to inherit his kingdom. Thirdly and finally, we can fear not because we are God's favorites. We are God's favorites. That word favorite might cause you pause. Favorite, it's a very strong word, I agree. But remember that at the root of the word favorite is the word favor. You might be thinking that it's unfair for God to have favorites, to show his favor to some, but not to all, to give his kingdom to some, but not to all. But remember what we heard earlier in Psalm 103. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. If God were fair, we would all be excluded from the kingdom. The question we shouldn't be asking this morning is why isn't God fair and show favor to everyone indiscriminately? Why doesn't he give everyone his kingdom? That's really the wrong question to ask. The right question to ask is why does God show favor to anyone at all? Why does he give his kingdom to anyone? I think we should be glad, not concerned, that God chooses to show favor over fairness. If God were fair, we'd all get what's coming to us. But mercifully, God delights to show favor to some, to not give us what we deserve and to give us what we don't deserve. If you're still a little unsure about saying that you're God's favorite, consider some of the words that are in this verse back in Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, Jesus calls his disciples. Little signifies small in number, maybe small in stature, insignificant in station in the world, and perhaps without strength, weak. But little, it's also a term of endearment, a term of affection and great love. For example, frequently when Owen was first born, Trisha and I would sweep him up into our arms and we'd look down into his face and we'd say, our little baby. Or right now, you'll often hear us calling him our little man. What do we mean by calling Owen little? We do mean that he is small with regard to size, but we say it with a tone of affection. Calling Owen little is just one way that we communicate our love for him. Owen, you may be little, but you are loved by your mom and by your dad. By the way, this is how God viewed his own people, Israel. The Lord says to them in Deuteronomy 7, 
The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people from his, for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That's favoritism. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. In other words, Israel, you were little. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and has redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Israel was little but loved by the Lord. They did nothing to get God's love. God chose to give it. He redeemed them from slavery in Egypt only because he loved them. They weren't great. They weren't strong. And so it is with the flock of Christ. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, not because they're strong, but because they are weak. Christ dies on the cross not for people who are great in power, great in righteousness and goodness, but for very great sinners, too little to help themselves. He died for his little sheep simply because he loved them. Do you grasp the amazing grace in all of this? In fact, grace is really what the word favorite is all about. To be someone's favorite simply means you're favored above others. Now, when fathers today have favorites among their own children, perhaps it's because that child has done something. That's not the case when it comes to God and his redeemed. He has favor because he chooses to have favor, not because we deserve it or earn it. Look again at those next words in verse 32. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus does not say it's your father's good pleasure to sell you the kingdom. He doesn't say it's your father's good pleasure to trade you the kingdom. He doesn't even say it's your father's good pleasure to render you the kingdom as your due reward. No, no. Jesus says it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In short, it's all due to God's grace and favor that we stand to inherit his kingdom. Listen, our father, the king, he doesn't go through the streets tossing out the riches of his family inheritance to everyone. Jesus is very, very intentional with his word choice here. Jesus says, your father delights to give you the kingdom. The your and the you in this verse is the little flock at the beginning of the verse. To put it bluntly, it would be very unloving to the shepherd, it would be very unloving to the shepherd's sheep to give the kingdom to the goats. It would be unloving to the king's children to give away their inheritance to rich rulers of an enemy nation. The kingdom is God's gift to give to whom he chooses. And in love, amazing, amazing love, he chooses to give it to a little flock. In joy, he is pleased to give it to his own children. Despite the fact that you and I can't earn it, we don't deserve it, nor can we win it, God chooses to favorably bestow it anyway. You see, the kingdom of God is given by him. It's not an award that you can achieve. It's God's gift for you to receive. If you're here this morning and you're worried about how all of that works, listen to Jesus' words to his disciples in another place. Truly, I say to you, Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. The kingdom is not for the mighty and the lofty to take by force. The kingdom is for the meek and lowly, like a little child. It's for those who are humble about their helplessness and their littleness before God. It's for those who, like a child, can walk up to the Father and ask, I know I don't deserve it, but would you be pleased to give it to me? Or let me rephrase it like this. I have nothing to be worthy of your kingdom, but I know Jesus Christ, he is worthy. And he said that when I trust in him, when I put my faith in him, and when he clothes me with his robes of righteousness, he said that I can come in. Look, Father, I'm in my big brother's robes. Those are the best hand-me-downs, aren't they? The robes of Jesus' righteousness. And here's how the Father would respond to such a request in his word. In Daniel, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. So the Father gives the kingdom. 
We simply inherit it, we receive it, and then we get to possess it forever, even forever and ever, all according to God's grace. Today, if you would have this kingdom, and if you would ever enter into it, you must receive it as a gift. You can't buy it, you can't barter for it, you can't break into it, you can't be good enough for it. Simply call out to God for grace through Jesus Christ, His Son, And he is pleased, more than pleased, to give you the kingdom. Do you see how Jesus uses the fatherhood of God to vaporize your fears? Perhaps the fear that you have this morning is the fear that God just isn't as good as he says he is. Jesus' words in Luke 12 ought to eliminate that fear completely. He says at the beginning of Luke 12, you need not fear what will happen to your life. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are more value than many sparrows. And then again, later in the chapter, he says, you need not fear that you're going to lack whatever you need in this life. Instead, seek God's kingdom, and these things will be added to you. You need not fear giving away any of your stuff, your possessions, or your money as if your future is going to be put in jeopardy if you're charitable and generous. And the reason, Jesus says, is that you can sell your possessions, you can give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure that's in the heavens that does not fail, where moth nor thief can harm your inheritance, your treasure. And then as we've seen this morning, you need not even fear that your father, the king, will leave you high and dry as if he's not good enough or good to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Lord Jesus here tells us the truth about God's heart because he knows we tend to fear the worst. Maybe you're here and you need to be reminded today about who God the father is. He's a good, he's a gracious, and he's a glad father. So fear not. He doesn't grimace when he gives you his very best of gifts. It's his good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You are little, but you are loved by your father. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise with us, the God of grace. Let's pray and then let's sing. Oh, Father, how good it is to call you our father and recognize just how good you are. So we heard in Psalm 103 from David how compassionate you are, like a father to his own children. And even how mindful you are of our frailties, our failings, our faults, our finiteness. You remember that we are dust, and yet, even though we are little, you love us. And so we want to exalt you today. We want to extol your grace. We want to extend it to the world and say, come into this kingdom by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, if there's anyone among us that has yet to do that, may they do that today, right now even, and receive you as the good father they need. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.